Book Two, Chapter Four. Orga. Where is David? Teddy asked. Amanda did not know how to respond to the little bear. The toy boy was in the pig pen where Mr. Johnson Johnson kept all the robots he broke in the show. He was a big stupid man with a silly name, and she hadn't liked it when Daddy started working for him. But it pays the bills, honey, as he always told her. Amanda didn't like all the things that Daddy had to do to pay the bills. I think they'll put him in the show," she said sadly. "But you can stay with me now," she smiled. The little bear's neck made whirring sounds as it looked around. It struggled in her grip. "I must see David," it said over and over. Amanda had never seen a toy act like this before. "You must take me to David now," it demanded again in its gruff mechanical bark. At first, the toy's insistence made Amanda feel sad, but slowly, it began to scare her. They had come from as far as Allentown and Trenton, and the partially submerged remains of Montclair, to see the show, the flesh fair, the celebration of life. They knew about Trenton and the organ man who'd been split open and killed in the Mecca Masher. They'd forgiven the Johnson for that. It could not have been intentional, and after all, the man was just a drifter, one who did not earn his lot. That kind made life as difficult as the Mecca had. Some had come because they believed that Johnson was the spokesman of their kind, the champion of the lost and forgotten orga that held society together at its roots. Those that the ungrateful and selfish wealthy had not found a way to replace, yet, others were here because there wasn't much left for them in this ruined world. But hard toil, hard drink, and a few mecca to screw up over the weekend, they were all colors and faith. Nor did age determine this demographic. Among them were those who had been replaced by mechanical workers, and even those who had benefited from the cheap labor of man-made slaves. No criterion except that of anger and resentment, often justifiable, could be used to define them. All of them wanted a show, and what a show the good Johnson Johnson was giving them tonight! The band had been better than usual, and Cynthia, that beautiful blonde pride of the orga, had paraded about waving their banner. And made speech after speech, working the faithful and the fun-loving alike into a frenzy. And while it seemed that there had been fewer mecca than usual, each one's disposal was treated like a small celebration of its own. And now, to top off the evening, the man himself made an entrance. It was the Johnson. The crowd stood and applauded. They cupped their eyes to see into the shadows behind the acid bath. He brought a new prize for them. Two of them, it looked like. They couldn't see clearly, but one of them looked like a new model. One of them lover robots. Well, this ought to be a riot. The crowd broke into an excited roar. Scantily clad assistants tossed little sandbags into the crowd. Their arms reached out like the necks of ravenous nestlings, craning for their mother's regurgitated nourishments. Up here, honey! Stewart called to his daughter. He had led Amanda from the control room and was lifting her little frame into a platform near the back of the stage. In the arena below, Johnson was preparing to address the crowd. Stewart had considered just taking the amazing little mecca, but he was outmanned. He thought then about enlisting the aid of some of his crew, but they had wives and children and homes to attend to. They'd never challenge Johnson. He'd even considered paying one of the audience members to claim the mecca belonged to them. Being property would surely protect this unique device. But in the end, he realized it was all just fantasy. One of the most ingenious pieces of work he had ever seen was about to be destroyed for a raucous crowd of drunks and misfortunates who would never even appreciate the genius of his design. But what had he wanted from the boy machine? He'd been a programmer years ago. He fell in love with defining personality parameters, defining the intellectual and logical limits that were necessary to make a machine act real, and that's why he had immediately recognized a difference in the boy machine. Even in their brief conversation, he'd seen the way its logic functioned differently from the other machines. But Stewart had never felt an attachment to a mecha. He was angry and hurt, but he didn't know why. Wasn't there something about this one? He would swear there was something. When he was looking at it, into its innocent gaze, something was looking back. He shrugged that thought off. It was silly and impossible. 
Then he saw the teddy in Amanda's arms. It was still protesting. It wouldn't shut up about David. How would such a bond develop between these machines? Where had these things come from? Amanda, honey, let me talk to the teddy for a minute, okay? He said, reaching for the bear. The little girl reluctantly let her father take the struggling toy. You must take me to David now, it repeated over and over. Stuart knew these old models. They functioned as smart toy regulators, so it should know manufacturers and possibly models. Who is David's maker? Stuart asked the super toy. The teddy ceased his complaints and looked at Stuart while it processed this question. Then its face folded into a grimace of impatience. Monica is David's mommy, it replied. David was dropped rudely by the angry man with the big black hat. He fell into the dirt, closing his eyes to protect them from the dust raised by his fall. When he opened them again, he noticed the money that had fallen from the pocket of his jacket. The last thing that Mommy had to offer him was lying in the dirt. He moved to retrieve his new bucks, but another man, even bigger and stronger than the first, lifted him quickly and placed him in the spotlights on the big metal stand. The pit bull thrust the lover bot on the platform with the little one. A double feature. The two lifelike simulators were then bound to the display with chains. The little one shackled in front of the larger. The orga in the darkness beyond the spotlights cheered and whooped. But not all of the crowd continued cheering. Some of them had been silenced by the sight of the small boy-like thing that had been hoisted into the lights of the acid bath. Lord Johnson Johnson waved his arms to silence the crowd. They were excited, his followers. So he'd be patient while they settled down. He could not see beyond the spotlights that bathed the arena in a fluorescent glow. But he knew who they were in the darkness beyond those lights. They were the forgotten ones. The abandoned and angry ones. They had a right to be angry. And they were about to get angrier. He was going to make sure of that. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, he started. For he was, after all, a showman. He turned and gestured to the mecha that were chained to the boards. What'll What'll I think of next? next? He asked them as they viewed the simulators. He gestured to David. See See here, here. a boy bot, a tinker Tinker toy, toy. a living doll. doll. He was silent while the crowd absorbed the sight of the little mecha. He heard some gasping and a few oh my gods from beyond the lights. It must have been the Trenton thing, damn it. He knew there'd be some squawkers among them, but he didn't know how many. They might take to the little mecha at first. He'd seen for himself how well it simulated emotions. But he'd show them the kind of commitment it would take to save themselves from the scourge of artificiality. He threw off his hat in a dramatic gesture. We all know why they make them, he shouted. To steal your hearts, to replace your own children. He began to pace the arena. He was going to capture them, bring them into his anger, and make it theirs. Because that's where it belonged, in them. This is the latest generation in a series of insults to human dignity. He was walking quickly now around the arena, addressing each section of the stands. His face shone in the huge monitors. He was their hero, their leader. Just the next step in the grand scheme to pay off all of God's little children? To make us obsolete? He had them now. He could hear their breath. He could feel their pulse racing. As his was. Their hatred was his electricity. The power which drove his machinery. Meet the next generation of child designed to do just that. He stopped finally and scowled at the mecha on the display. Behold the newest and most insidious threat to Orga kind. The Orga in the stand saw it, observed it carefully. What was this? A little boy? They knew the derelicts hid in the outskirts with the runaway mecha. What if they had grabbed one of the vagabond kids by accident? That ain't no mecha, someone whispered. Remember Trenton, said someone else. There was confusion, indecision about this. David gazed into the darkness beyond the lights. They were silent out there now. Just some soft muttering is all he could hear. The fear inside him had reached a new level. He, like no robot before him, anticipated his demise. Beyond the lights lay the source of an inexplicable hatred that David had never seen, that he did not understand that no mecha would ever comprehend. Humanity itself had yet to answer the question, from whence does this hatred come? Above David, a man was pouring a liquid into buckets, a liquid that would reduce him to fibrous clumps, 
a liquid that would take from the world a truly unique creation and take from David something no Mecca had ever known. Lord Johnson Johnson, self-appointed savior of mankind, recognized the tenderness that lay at the core of the hesitancy of his disciples. But he knew what insidious plot lay at the heart of this ingenious simulator. Do not be fooled by the artistry of this creation, he warned them, and fixed them all with the uncompromising glare that had burned a path through whatever obstacle lay in his way since Dublin. No doubt there was talent, genuine human talent in the crafting of this simulator. Yet with the very first strike, you will see the big lie come apart. Something struck the arm of David's jacket softly. He heard something hissing and looked at the place where it had landed. It was burning. Why was it burning? He looked above his head and saw the man filling the buckets. The image of the nanny's melting face alerted through his brain. This was the destroying place. Don't burn me! Don't burn me! He cried. I'm not Pinocchio. I'm David! I'm David! He didn't belong here. This was a place for robots. He was David. He was a boy. A woman rose from the crowd. She'd been startled by the sound. What the hell was that? W was that a child? The small helpless thing cried and screamed like an orga. Mecca don't plead for their lives, she yelled. People stood and grunted acknowledgement around her. Whose child is that? Someone said. He looks like a boy, yelled another. I'm David. David. Don't, don't burn, burn me. me. Don't, don't, make don't make me die, die. he yelled as the crowd looked on in confusion. This thing was well constructed, Johnson realized. Clever the way it tried to steal their hearts. But he would show them how to do it. It's built, it's built like a boy like to this arm us, he explained. See how they yeah, imitate our emotions now? now? He thought he had them again. They were silent, spellbound. Behind him the Mecca cried and sputtered gibberish like a living thing. But they would see. They would see. Remember that no matter what performance this sim puts on, we are only demolishing artificiality. There wasn't a sound to be heard, except the whimpering of the phony boy thing. Johnson picked up a sandbag from the ground and held it high. The destruction of this machine would be a symbol of their commitment. Their commitment to a world of, by, and for Orga. Their commitment to life and all living things. Their commitment to him. Let he who was without Sim cast the first stone, he said, and stepped away from the killing zone. Johnson could not see beyond the lights, could not read their faces. He waited. Eventually one of them stood and took aim. He was a simple man. He came to the flesh fear because he knew the frustrations of the modern age and what it had done to Orga kind. Like Johnson had done so long ago, he maintained his land with his bare hands. He couldn't afford the Mecca. Every year it was a struggle to keep up with the big Mecca-based businesses, which were stealing more and more of the limited local markets. Even those who hated the robots bought from the big corporate chains now. The prices were just too good. He'd been at the fair in Trenton when that man had died. In the ensuing months, he'd seen the reprisals and the attacks on the Johnson. He felt bad about it, because he always believed that the Johnson was a good man, and that he had a point. Tonight, he'd been watching when them big old pipples had the scared-looking little machine from the cage, and onto the acid bath display. He'd watched him chain the little fake thing onto the wheel. All the while, the Johnson had been explaining to them how dangerous this thing was. He'd been listening. He'd been listening too when the thing started to cry. And when Johnson had called it then to strike at the pathetic simulator, he'd stood up from the crowd and taken careful aim. He'd always believed that Johnson was a good man and that he had a point. But this man had a point too. A point he would not go beyond. He let the bag fly. The first sandbag hit Johnson square in the forehead, and it hurt. His arm had moved to deflect the strike, but too late. Damn idiot farmers, he thought. Whoa there, is what he said through the microphone, though. He smiled up at the stands to show he understood it was a mistake. That was when the other bag hit him. This one caught his nose and caused him to see stars. A bright pain flared in his head. Then another hit him just below the waist, causing him to buckle. Then another, and another, and soon he was being pelted from all directions of the arena. They roared at him. Johnson, you're a monster. He's just a boy. What's enough, Johnson? What's enough? They wanted to know. 
What in the hell was wrong with these people? He shouted at them. It's a machine, you idiots! It's a toy! But his voice was lost in the rage of disapproval and the incredulity of those he'd imagined to be his loyal and trusting disciples. Never had the Johnson so severely misread an audience. They'd been incredulous that he would destroy something so small and helpless, so fragile. And so what if it wasn't Mecca? Even from the stands they could tell it wasn't like the others. It wasn't trying to steal their jobs, take their money. It wasn't out to exploit their wives or husbands' weaknesses. It was just a toy, some little boy. Someone had wanted love, and the Johnson had been too blind to see it, too selfish to care. They stormed from the stands and onto the arena floor. Cynthia had started walking backwards from the arena floor when she'd seen the first bag hit Johnson. She'd had an uneasy feeling about the crowd's silence as the stupid pit bulls let the little boy thing onto the field and to the acid bath display. Johnson was such a pompous fool sometimes. He really thought he could go as far as he wanted. As the audience filled the arena floor, she turned and hurried away. She ran quickly into the shadows behind the bleachers. As she made her way into the dressing rooms to get her stuff, she passed the band who were already packing their gear. Hey, need a ride, baby? The singer asked. His eyes were appraising her. Without that silly metal mask, he wasn't really that bad. Let me get my stuff, she said, and raced to her dressing room. There was always another gig. Stuart had heard all about Mommy's flight and their trip through the forest. He was amazed to hear about the Blue Fairy and David's quest. Teddy had explained everything in short, precise sentences as Johnson had ranted in the arena. Stuart had been prepared for one of the most dismal nights of his life. He was prepared to watch that beautiful piece of machinery destroyed at the hands of a lunatic. Then he blinked in amazement as the crowd suddenly began to pelt Johnson with the bags. Yes, he yelled, and grabbed Amanda. Honey, say goodbye to Teddy. His daughter looked up sadly, but she understood. She was happy the boy toy wasn't going to be burned up like the others, and she knew that Teddy was his friend, but she hated to see them go. Goodbye, Teddy, she said. Her little voice was breaking, and the tears were starting to flow. Goodbye, Amanda, Teddy responded. Stuart kissed his daughter quickly and grabbed the bear, racing towards the field. He had to get out there quickly before some idiot accidentally knocked over the acid and ruined one of the most unique devices he'd ever had the privilege of meeting. David did not understand what was happening. His sense of alarm diminished when he saw the multitude from beyond the lights suddenly race into the field and began knocking things over. They roared and threw things at the big men in black who retreated quickly, fleeing the imposing onslaught. Had he misunderstood them? This was not the same as the destroying he had witnessed earlier. He pressed himself tighter against the man Mecca behind him. Then suddenly the man called Stuart was beside him. He was smiling and looked excited. Joe had finally understood what was happening. He'd only wish he'd taken time to shut down his sensory system. But Joe had not understood the pleading noises the little one had made. He was glad, however, to see the effect the crying game had on the crowd. They were not going to be scrapped tonight. He smiled at the organ man who started trying to untie them. Stewart had one of the men take the buckets of acid down so no one would get burnt. Help me get them out of here, you oafs, he yelled. The huge men in black were dumbfounded at the response of the crowd. Some of them had fled. Others had rushed the Johnson off to safety as the ride had begun. But otherwise, they'd had no appropriate response to the situation. Let's get them out now before they tear this place apart, Stuart yelled. Finally, the men saw his point, and they began yanking the chains loose. In moments, the two machines were set free, and Stuart set the teddy down on the ground next to the special machine. He took one last look at the boy thing. He wished he had time to study it, time to understand what made it different from anything he had ever seen. But he figured the machine that David had his own mission his own dream. Amazing. Get out of here! Run! Stewart yelled at David and his friends. The odd trio looked around in confusion for a moment, and then fled towards the gates, away from the crowd of rampaging Orga. They left behind the wreckage of their brethren, those who had not been designed suitably to elicit sympathy. The destruction of the older decrepit machines was another pitiful chapter in an ancient Orga farce. Of the three, David was the only one capable of mourning the fallen robots. But David had other things on his mind. They ran past the gates and into the dark night. The deep, gloomy forest was a welcome sight, offering shadows in which to hide. 
Behind them, the noise of fighting and confusion rose and spiraled into a crescendo. The robots ran quickly, leaving the flesh bear behind them, leaving behind another fallen Orga hero to face his fate. <laughs>